and we'll be next having Dr. Tina Pears sharing her experience with regards to long COVID. Thank you very much, Tina. And um, what we'll do is we'll get straight into your presentation at the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you for this opportunity to talk. Um, so if next slide, please. Um, I opened my long COVID clinic in November 2020, having heard about the symptoms that long COVID patients were suffering from uh, and asking patients with long COVID to download an app and put in their profiles of all their symptoms. And over 2000 people did and their symptoms absolutely mirrored those of patients who I've been treating for the last six or seven years with MCAS, which is mast cell activation syndrome. So my theory was that um, acute COVID was exacerbating MCAS just as other viruses do, um, and, but it was particularly good at doing that and causing a great host of inflammatory um, responses in the patients, giving uh, so many different diverse symptoms. Also, it could be that the acute COVID um, caused MCAS in the minority of patients. And I've certainly seen two patients in whom there was no previous history suggestive of MCAS and they responded incredibly quickly and well to the, to the treatment um, and are now completely asymptomatic. There is also viral persistence, which is constantly stimulating the mast cells in the patients with abnormal mast cells and possibly others. We don't know yet, but we know that um, Dr. Bruce Patterson's work and his team have identified viral persistence, certainly um, in the monocytes of these patients. And also we know that there is the effect, as, Dr., as Professor Pretorius has talked about, with um, causing uh, hypercoagulation and microclots with hy cellular hypoxia. And we also have seen reactivation by the virus of different viruses that are present. So EBV, that's glandular fever, cytomegalovirus um, and Lyme's disease. And um, there are some patients who give a very strong history of having those diseases in the past. Uh, and we think that there's reactivation. And when we look at the antibodies, we can see that. So, But what I think is a really important point that's already come up in discussion is that the failure to treat acute COVID with early treatments, which we know work, increases the incidence of long COVID. Um, and that's what we need to be doing, is doing early effective early treatment of acute COVID uh, to minimize the, the risk of long COVID for patients. And there are some excellent protocols by uh, Dr. Peter McCulloch and his team, by the FLCCC and on the World Council for Health.org website for treating acute COVID. Next slide, please. So mast cell activation, this is a genetic condition. It runs in families. Um, it's frequently seen and seldom recognized. We think it's up to 17% of the population have this dysfunction. And there are something called kit genes and 50 different mutations have been identified in the kit genes. Unfortunately, the kit genes are not commercially available to be tested for. So that um, leaves us a little bit in the dark with that. But it's very much um, in America, they have some fantastic labs that can look for uh, the cytokines, etc., that are released by the mast cells. In the UK, we don't yet, but I think Dr. Patterson is going to change that, which is very exciting. Um, and um, so we have this condition that has gone under the radar of most of my colleagues in medicine for many years. Um, it was newly described first uh, cases were published in 2007, so it's quite new. Um, and it's where the symptoms are caused by the cytokines and the amines being released by the mast cells. Um, and often histamine intolerance is a frequent feature where patients don't metabolize histamine very effectively and efficiently. And therefore, when there's an increase in histamine, they have problems. Next slide, please. Next slide, lovely. So um, we know it's a younger age group. It's predominantly women. It's about 10 to 20% of the COVID-19 acute COVID cases. Um, with their, uh, there was a, an excellent uh, paper by Berger Maschi at Cambridge University that was published last year on, in January, where they looked at the response of uh, patients with acute COVID um, and saw that there were two groups, actually. Some people responded very well and their parameters got back to normal very quickly. Their, um, their antibodies re resolved very quickly. And then there was a group of about 17, 20% where the infection, did the, where they had an abnormal response um, immunologically, and then they didn't quite get back to normal. And they were the patients who had long COVID. Um, so next slide, please. So I've been treating patients um, as for mast cell activation, and I must say we've been getting some good results. I'm not going to dwell on this slide because uh, Dr. Manan Bregg 
did a very good presentation of all the symptoms, um, just to say uh, hypertension and POTS type symptoms and brain fog, anxiety, insomnia, fatigue, and post-exertional malaise are the ones that really um, are the most common and cause the most consternation amongst the patients. Next slide, please. So um, how do we start? Where do we start? Where do we start? So we have a very sort of functional kind of approach looking at methylation and the genetics, um, at uh, detoxification, um, nutrient status, thyroid function in the patients, their hormones, inflammation, um, the GI uh, analysis, terribly important, looking at the gut where 70% of our immunity is, um, mitochondria and ATP production is another area that we're just now looking into and helping to support detoxification in the liver. Next slide, please. So what do I do? Well, the approach that I'm taking and lots of uh, many other colleagues who treat patients with mast cell activation um, is, are taking with the long COVID patients is the same approach. And a lot of these patients are seeing not just conventional um, doctors like myself, but also functional medicine practitioners uh, and nutritional therapists and so on who, who take this kind of approach. So we ask them to take a low histamine diet. And actually, this does make a huge difference. Um, and it is... Um, it's if you've got a pretty full histamine bucket, you don't really want to be eating a whole load of histamine foods because they're just going to be added to your, adding to your inflammation, um, which cause all the multiple symptoms. So uh, we give them type one antihistamines, and it's very important to sort of walk through the different medications one at a time initially, layering on the different uh, type one, type two, and the Marcel app, um, stabilizers. Um, so that you can see which one you respond to best of all. So I have patients take loratadine 10 milligrams three times a day uh, for a couple of weeks and see if they respond well. If they do and it's a keeper, then we keep it. If they say at the end of two weeks, I'm not sure I feel any better, then they probably don't and they get rid of it and then try cetirizine in the same way. And if again, go on to fexofenadine if necessary. Um, type, then we add a type 2 antihistamine, so famotidine is the strongest, 20 milligrams twice a day, um, and then we go on to Marcel stabilizers, and uh, rupatidine um, is an excellent one. Ketotophen is my favorite to start with because it causes sleepiness and helps them to sleep, which is fantastic, insomnia being one of their symptoms, um, and we start off with half a mil uh, at night, gradually increasing by half mil increments until they're on five milligram, uh, five mils, which is one milligram. If they do really well with it, and some for some patients it's a, it's a, it's a game changer, um, then they could go up to two milligrams at night, and some patients are taking two, two milligrams in the morning, but you build it up very slowly. Sodium chromoglycate is a very useful mast cell stabilizer, um, and especially if they have gut symptoms, and quercetin is something that everyone can buy over the counter that is a mast cell stabilizer, um, also present in cauliflower and um, quail's legs, but you'd have to eat a considerable amount amount of those to get the same that you can get in the tablet. Next slide, please. So probiotics are very important because um, uh, there's a lot of dysbiosis in these patients. Uh, we find that their, their gut microbiome is often completely out with SIBO and, uh, and other um, bacteria imbalances and also mucosal stresses and strains so that their mucosa is breaking down and they get leaky gut syndrome. We give various vitamins and minerals to support them. Um, selenium, very important, magnesium, etc. You can see them. Ivermectin I do use and has been an absolute game changer for many of my patients uh, where they find that many of their symptoms subside or um, reduce certainly when they take the ivermectin. Um, many of my patients do neuroplastic retraining of the amygdala and insulin. I know it's an area that is quite um, contentious, but uh, the, I think that, that many of the patients say they can feel up to 30% better. And we're learning more and more about brain plasticity and how we can tap into that. Melatonin helpful for those who can't sleep and who aren't on the ketotophen. Next slide, please. I think this is my last slide. Montelicast is the leukotriene um, inhibitor, which can be very helpful. We have to be careful. 30% of patients can get depression with this. So we have to watch out for that. 
LDN, that's low dose naltrexone, which you build up very slowly, half mil, uh, milligram increments per week from half a mil up to 4.5 milligrams daily. This helps particularly with the neuro, neurological symptoms. Uh, so tingling, pains in the feet, that vibratory feeling that people have. Um, diazepam can be helpful, colchicine uh, and anti-inflammatory. I use Vedicinals 9, um, but they have to come off some of the medication and some of the supplements. Do see the website for that guidance. Some of my patients have really had some very good results with Vedicinals 9. And we're now using um, our, a, a micro current device, which helps to reset homeostasis in the um, tissues and increases ATP. And so we're just starting to use that. So we're just starting to use that. So we'll see. And we're also looking at the apheresis, um, saunas, cold water swimming, uh, and uh, anticoagulants. So sorry, there's a lot to cover in 10 minutes. <laughs> tremendous, tremendous. And you will have the opportunity to, to look at some of those things um, in a little bit more detail um, later on. So um, thank you very much. And we'll get you to talk to the panel quite shortly and they'll ask you some more questions but before we do we'll quickly get the thoughts of um, Bruce Patterson here um, with us to share some of his work and research so thank you Bruce um, you're muted at the moment and um, I'll just bring up your slides uh, straight away great thank you very much <clears throat> so yes uh, I'm going to talk about the diagnosis treatment and immunopathogenesis of chronic inflammatory diseases it's a similar talk to what I gave um, two weeks ago uh, at a Congress, uh, Immunology Congress in the United States. Next slide. Um, you know, the bottom line is PASCA fix uh, up to 30% of individuals. Um, however, uh, other uh, similar uh, symptom wise diseases such as ME CFS affect somewhere between one and three million patients. And next slide, please. That's why I think we have to be careful about how we categorize some things that share the same symptoms as I'm about to show. Um, there was someone who was quoted in the United States in an article about what we were doing is saying, why, why do we need diagnostics? We know from the symptoms uh, that, they're, that they're long COVID. Well, nothing could be further from the truth as long COVID shares symptoms with MECFS, fibromyalgia, post Lyme, and as I'll show post-vaccination um, individuals with um, PASC-like symptoms. But the bottom line is we started um, working on COVID in uh, late January of 2020 with our colleagues in China. We had a panel of over 150 biomarkers and we published a first paper on the use of CCR5 antagonists in acute COVID. But what it really showed us was the backdrop of what was going on in acute COVID. And of course, um, what we found and what's really profound in this slide is, um, uh, is the B uh, graph, which shows that there was extremely low CD8 counts in acute COVID. And that's pretty universal, some to the level that you would expect of CD4 counts in HIV individuals. So these patients are su supremely immunosuppressed. And we found that 25% of individuals with long COVID have low CD8 counts. Well, what does that do? It makes you susceptible to reactivation of, of course, the herpes family viruses, HSV, EBV, CMV, uh, et cetera, that have been associated with MECFS, the chronic viral infections, and of course, even proviral uh, latency uh, infections like HIV. The bottom line is I saw a paper try, that said it could predict um, in acute COVID who got long COVID and one of the parameters was EBV. To me, that looked like an exacerbation of MECFS and not true PASC. So we came up with the, with the um, categories of, of PASC and PASC plus, and I'll show you more distinction on that in, in a moment. Next slide. Again, this just represents uh, how many PASC individuals and in MECFS um, uh, individuals were seen as, as part of um, uh, the pandemic. Next slide. Uh, and again, one of the issues is, is there viral replication? Uh, we published a paper in Frontiers in Immunology in January showing persistent um, viral antigen in uh, non-classical and class intermediate monocytes 
in the absence of whole, of complete viral particles. We showed viral RNA. And I literally just got data five minutes ago from our bioinformatics group that was doing the tissue studies showing that uh, in tissue from uh, PASC individuals, uh, there's less than 5% complete genome coverage. So even though we can detect RNA by DDPCR, uh, in situ hybridization, these are all fragment uh, detection schemes. Uh, immunohistochemistry, which one paper showed is, is just detecting protein, um, which we, you know, we published in the monocytes as well. But fact is, we just finished our first round of whole genome sequencing in tissue from PASC individuals. And there is uh, very little representation of the entire genome, which would be required for uh, replication competent virus. Next slide. And here's this symptom. So, so we first published this, and this is uh, a small subset uh, of what Davis et al. published before on the symptoms uh, in PASC. And the red blotches are actually the major symptoms in MECFS. So there's significant overlap uh, in these two clinical entities. So to say, you could call somebody a long um, COVID individual just from symptoms is, 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 uh, is incorrect. Next slide. We went on to study uh, individuals post-vaccination who had PASC-like symptoms, a condition that we call POVIP. Um, uh, post-vaccination individuals with PASC-like symptoms. And believe it or not, it's the same symptom complex that we're seeing in PASC, MECFS, chronic fatigue syndrome, and et, et cetera. And I won't go into too much more detail other than to say it's got the same symptoms. Next slide. Then we used our um, diagnostic, which was chosen by uh, AI out of our 150 biomarkers um, to ca categorize uh, long COVID. And again, you see some very important uh, associations in red that give you confidence uh, in the validation of this panel. In other words, IL-13 and IL-4 are co-expressed because they're type two uh, inflammatory cytokines. Uh, the other lower red box, interferon gamma, drives IL-10 uh, replication. So they're closely associated by this uh, heat map. So we've cross-validated uh, all of these cytokines against one another in all four of those conditions, long COVID, um, MECFS, fibromyalgia, post-Lyme, uh, and post-vaccination uh, long haulers. Next slide. Again, this is an overlap of the two algorithms uh, on the horizontal axis, the long uh, hauler index, and in, this, um, in the vertical axis, the severity score, but the reality is they're just inflammatory marker scores and uh, they've been mischaracterized uh, as diagnostics. Um, but it really shows you the difference uh, in the inflammatory uh, milieu in, in these patients. Next slide. Next slide, I wanna get on to um, uh, our treatment. Again, we found obviously um, S1 protein and monocytes both in long COVID, next slide and is post-vaccination uh, long haulers. Next slide. Why is that important? Because we too found uh, a, this vascular endotheliitis, which leads to the clotting that's been described previously. But the bottom line is this interaction between uh, these non-classical monocytes, which carry the fractal kind receptor and fractal kind on the endothelium leads to inflammation and believe it or not, type one cytokine response, which is the long hauler index. So we really feel the CCR5, CCL5 pathways and the fractal kind, fractal kind receptor pathways are key elements in the pathogenesis of not only PASC, but uh, post-vaccination long haulers. Next slide. And when these uh, monocytes bind to the fractal kind receptor, they cause increases in VEGF, which cause peripheral neuropathies, this head fullness, headaches, migraines, so that when we block fractal kinds with statins and we block the migration of these monocytes with CCR5 antagonists, 
we actually can relieve the brain fog and all the other symptoms uh, in PASC and post-vaccination long haulers. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. I just wanna show this new classification based on cytokine nodes where we can uh, distinguish between um, MECFS, which is in purple, PASC, which is in green, post-vaccination long haulers in blue, severe COVID uh, and Lyme over to the left. This is critical because all of these patients require different therapy. When I talk about PASC, I'm talking about pure PASC, which is in green. And you know what? We can't just keep saying, oh, I treat this and this works and that works. And people say, well, multitude of drugs works. Yeah, of course it does because we're going along with symptoms instead of really classifying uh, each of these entities um, as separate entities, which they are because they have separate etiologies. And this paper uh, is about to be submitted. Next slide. Next slide. This is what's really exciting is this is a study that came out in preprint on our use of Maraviroc and statins with uh, FDA uh, accepted um, symptom scores and the correlation with biomarkers. Here's the Rankin index uh, for no neuro disease, highly statistically significant after six to 12 weeks of symptoms. And it correlates with soluble CD40 ligand, which is made by activated platelets and VEGF. Next slide. Uh, compass, which is um, dysautonomia. Again, highly statistically significant decrease after six to 12 weeks of Maraviroc and statins correlated with soluble CD40 ligand, GMCSF and VEGF. Next slide. Dysmia, same thing. Next slide. Fatigue. This is absolutely critical. We now know if you look over in the biomarker correlation that fatigue in PASC is caused by TNF alpha with a P value of 10 to minus five, okay? And interleukin two with a very strong correlation and a very low P value after six to 12 weeks of Maraviroc and statins, uh, which of course blocks the two pathways that I showed before. Next slide. And again, that NYHA, another neuro um, uh, uh, parameter score, again, correlated with biomarkers. So we're now at the point where we know which biomarkers correlate with which symptoms. And when those biomarkers uh, are, are go down with therapy, we can correlate that with response uh, as far as the symptoms. This paper is out for peer review. Um, we're very excited about it. We hope it comes out very, very soon. It's designed just like our clinical trial will be designed. And that's why it's so important that all five symptom scores had statistically significant decreases after six to 12 weeks of Maraviroc and statins. When we enrolled specifically PASC and eliminated PASC plus EBV, Epstein-Barr, um, Lyme, I can't tell you how many times we've done telemedicine and someone will say, oh, by the way, I had really bad mono, I have EBV, or I have CMV, or I have herpes, I have varicella, I have Lyme, okay? For me, that puts us in a PASC plus category, and maybe we include Lyme therapy, or maybe we include anti-herpes therapy as we correct the immune response with, um, with Maraviroc and statins. And again, get to the source of clotting, which is in our new paper, we are completely on board with the clotting, but what we wanna do is actually eliminate um, the nidus for the clotting, which is the uh, endotheliitis. And CCR5 antagonism and statins are right out of the atherosclerosis um, literature. So we think we're really on the right path in terms of not only relieving brain fog, symptoms like that, but also relieving the source um, of what's causing the clotting and the, and the platelet activation.
Excellent. Excellent. Well, we'll come back to this, um, and Bruce, when we get the panelists to have a chat with you. So thank you very, very much. And so what we'll do is that um, if we can get Dr. Shankar Shetty to, to join us and uh, just to share some general thoughts as um, his spotlight with regards to long COVID. Um, I, I'll just let you do that before we get the speakers back in, Shankara. Thanks, Philip. Uh, look, what, what I'm seeing with my patients with uh, long COVID is that we have, an, uh, we have an acute illness which, if not treated or caught or recognized early on, uh, spirals out of control. And we know that there's various mechanisms at play. Uh, each mechanism seems to be self-sustaining leading in different directions. And so the longer it takes for a long COVID patient to present to the uh, healthcare practitioner, the more diverse the symptoms, underlying symptoms might be. So from the perspective of uh, TINA and uh, uh, treating mast cell activation early on and preventing these long symptoms, I think vitally important. And then from the perspective of uh, Bruce, it's vitally important for us to separate out all the different long COVID patients uh, there is immune uh, dysregulation, there is immune suppression, bringing on latent infections. So we need to be able to categorize the different uh, long COVID cases and be able to biomark them or at least differentiate them into these different categories so that we can uh, institute appropriate treatment. So I think both the presentations are vitally important in trying to understand the way forward, because this is going to be something we'll probably be doing for the next five years at the least, if it has no bearing on vaccine side effects like Bruce alluded to, probably longer. Oh, yes, quite right. Yep, wonderful. Let me just add our other panelists um, to our stream now. And we're going to be chatting with the, the last two speakers um and then what we'll do is bring everybody in and just open the the conversation um and so why don't we just bring first in tina and does anybody want to start off asking uh tina any questions yes i can start if if that's all right yes yeah. um so very um uh, brief uh summary so we know that patients do suffer uh, with MCAS in long COVID. However, the problem that uh, we see is that, for example, in the UK, several immunologists gauge MCAS as an academic diagnosis, which they cannot apply clinically. As they say, it is just a collection of symptoms and increased histamine. So patients are in a position to self-advocate to get H1 and H2 medicines. So you're an expert in this area. And could you advise what are the blood test abnormalities associated with MCAS? It's, um, it's a very difficult one to do in the UK. They, we look at uh, things, things like histamine levels, heparin levels can be checked, um, and uh, uh, chromogronin A and um, uh, what else? There's, there's not that many, and the tests aren't very available in the UK, unfortunately. They are in America, um, but here we just don't treat the samples properly, uh, and they need to be centrifuged in cold centrifuges and tr transported cold and this sort of thing. And unfortunately, we just get lots of false results here. So it's been incredibly disappointing, uh, and I've been waiting for um, Bruce to come along, really, with his labs, because um, I think that will help us to differentiate what's going on at the, you know, at the, at the biomarker level, which we have been completely working blind uh, up until this point, really. Um, when my patients go and see immunologists in the UK, especially, they sometimes have great difficulty uh, and, you know, convincing them that the, these symptoms are linked and that there probably is, possibly is MCAS going on. Um, and that's a great shame because they come across a brick wall. And even when I've given them uh, various standard MCAS treatments and they've responded really well, um, sometimes their GPs won't continue the prescriptions, which is really sad. Um, some are get it, some do, but some unfortunately don't. And the patients are left in a very difficult position where they're having to pay for private scripts 
um, to, you know, and some of this medication is fairly long term really for them. But uh, we do see good results um, and that's very gratifying. But um, a lot of them need, you know, and and do people don't have to take, um, in my experience, they don't have to take all these drugs forever. They often can reduce uh, as their inflammation settles and they start to get better. They can reduce their type 1 and type 2 antihistamines, for example, or, um, uh, you know, and just keep on with the mast cell stabilizer and add in the others when they have a flare. But uh, no, it is it's difficult. But we're looking forward to Bruce's labs. And if I can jump in as well, uh, you mentioned low histamine diet. Is yeah. it something that people need to take for life or it's something temporary? Well, that's a very good question. And uh, sadly, the basis of a low histamine diet, most of the MCAS patients do have to follow reasonably strictly. Um, once their histamine levels are lower, and also once we support their, once we improve their gut health, and we also um, support their liver um, detoxification and look at their methylation cycles and things, then often they can get away with tolerating much more, uh, which is brilliant. So they, but they always know when they've overstepped the mark <laughs> and they've got carried away and had too much histamine in their diet because then they will have the symptoms again. Um, but people are pretty good at being fairly disciplined about it. It's not an awful diet. I have a low histamine diet and my daughter does. And we, we eat very healthily and very delicious food. Um, we just can't eat all the things that we used to eat before <laughs> so much. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, yeah, I've got go ahead, one. yeah, I've got one for Tina. Um, so when you meet a brick wall with your GP, or maybe not a brick wall, but like a papier-mâché wall, where do you, what resources are there? Where do you send them to? How do you help inform clinicians who are maybe MCAS curious, perhaps, but haven't quite fully bought in yet? What, what, what are the best resources out there? Well, the, there's um, the Marcel, um, um, Marcel.org, I think it is, uh, Marcel Action. Oh, gosh, now I've forgotten. Sorry, I've got a senile moment here. Um, there, are, there are one or two charities out there, which is, I think it's Marcel Action, uh, and they're very good, and they have a lot of resources. Can you look quickly, Jez? Is that right? <laughs> yeah, we yeah, trust that a little bit. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, and they, they, they have a lot of information and they do a lot of support for patients. So they will advocate for patients, actually. Um, and uh, and they, they can be very helpful. There are some very good websites like uh, Dr. Dempsey in America. She has some very good information on her website. Um, and it's, it's getting better, I must say, since long COVID has been around and we've been talking about MCAS, my feeling is that more and more of my co consultant colleagues are writing and including MCAS in their letters, you know, and, and actually recognizing it, which is really helpful. I've got cardiologists who send me patients who, you know, are absolutely on board with MCAS. So that's a big change. That's been in the last six, six months, 12 months, really. So there is hope, and I think it will continue to get better as more and more patients talk about it to doctors. Doctors' curiosity increases and they have to find out more, hopefully. So just to follow up on that, it's yeah. marcelaction.org. Uh, and yeah. Dr. Tanya Dempsey's website is drtanyadempsey.com. Thank you. And any questions, Shankara? Uh, just a comment uh, to Tina. Uh, with the long COVID, uh, Tina, clearly in some patients we see that it is more cell activation. And I think that's uh, quite clear from the speed to recovery of those patients who've been suffering mm. sometimes for a year and show a clinical improvement within a week of uh, instituting mm. these treatments. But I, uh, I, I, I took the liberty with long COVID patients to test immunoglobulin E, being a slower marker, and of course would show up in these patients. And I found a subset of patients with very high levels and clearly mast cell activation. And those are the ones that seem to do best. I'm eager to hear from Bruce with the separation of uh, post-acute uh, uh, COVID uh, and the separation into the different categories because I've also seen patients with uh, normal to slightly elevated Ig levels, but with severe symptoms. And clearly, these are probably in a different group experiencing other pathologies and need different treatment approaches. So I think, uh, yeah, Bruce is, uh, like you, I'm waiting to see what Bruce has got for us when it comes to differentiating the different categories of long COVID. 
Excellent, excellent. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll shift along now. And um, Tina, of course, we're going to open up the forum to everybody. I think there's some very important points when we pull the, the minds together. I think that's going to be very, very valuable. So let's move on to our next uh, panel section, Bruce, and we'll let them quiz you about all these cytokines that they um, want to find. Uh, anybody you want to go first, Shankara? Since... <laughs> Hi Bruce. Uh, yeah, Hello. I must, I must say uh, the, the the classification of the illness into different categories is vitally important. Yeah. Uh, yes, you were rightfully there, there in saying that the clinical picture overlaps a lot with things we've seen in the past, mm -hmm. and we need to differentiate this. The spiraling of long COVID uh, affects many systems, and it can be the principal cause of the pathology, or it can be secondary to long COVID, like immunosuppression and uh, latent viruses and that kind of thing. So I hope that we can figure out a set of markers where we can differentiate the patients into different categories, simple tests that could uh, basically show the different categories and, and, and dictate the different treatment interventions so that we're not scratching our heads and trying different things and not sure what actually worked. So, yeah, I think the work you're doing is vitally important. I must, I must actually thank you for that. Thank you. Well, you know, it's, what's interesting is... Um, you know, when we developed um, this panel, uh, you know, with the help of AI, um, we covered innate immunity, adaptive immunity, um, even inflammatory with IL-13. And IL-13 has become very important, as you suggest, and as Tina inferred, um, in terms of, uh, you know, this inflammatory component that could be histamines, it could be, we saw a surge uh, in symptoms in the summer with allergies, right? So uh, it was just by by chance that um, you know um, that we could you know distinguish between you know all those elements uh, of the immune system, you know, and then the categorization is absolutely critical. And we're actually developing a new test that does RNA to DNA ratios of the chronic um, uh, viruses like EBV because the serology is terrible. In 30 years of pathology, the one bane of my existence has been trying to interpret uh, serology for EBV, CMV. 85% um, of people have herpes simplex uh, antibodies. So it's very difficult to say who's truly reactivating and who's not. But I'll tell you, I've had 20, 30 patients who have something between ME-CFS and, and long COVID which I give Valtrex in addition to Moravrac and statins and suppress their EBV and they respond uh, remarkably. So, um, so that was the whole purpose of having accurate categorization uh, of these individuals so that ultimately uh, treatment could be tailored. I think sometimes we see subclinical presentations. So patients have symptoms that are not typical of these illnesses. And that's where I think the testing is vitally important to directors. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I'll let um, Jess or Valentina, any questions? Uh, yeah, I've got one for Bruce. Um, what's your, I mean, obviously you had a paper where you found uh, viral debris in monocytes. What's your current thinking on the relationship between uh, the possibility of viral persistence and viral debris? And if there is persistence, how much of a time does it exist? And where, where is it hiding? Yeah, no, so Jez, that's such a great question. And it's actually the same um, debate that's been going on in Lyme for, for decades. You know, is the bug still there or remnants of the bug? There's great literature that we've cited in our publications that show that these monocytes carry the cell wall of Borrelia and Bartonella, the, the bugs that cause Lyme, in the absence of the bug. And that's the new kind of uh, discovery, the new, uh, I, I think, focus in immunology that we've kind of brought to the attention of long COVID is that you may not need viral replication. And in fact, we went to great pains to sequence the whole genome in those monocytes. And yes, we found RNA at 15 months. That's no surprise, but they're pieces and fragments and they can't come together to form a new virion, okay? And as I just said, just this morning, I got data from tissue biopsies from long COVID 
because this has been a debate and I'm, I'm fine. I'll engage in the debate. I'm just on the side of what you used to call, and I love the term was, um, you know, debris or, you know, uh, vir viral debris, because essentially that's what it is. And we found less than 5% uh, of the genome in long COVID uh, tissue biopsies. We found it. Yeah, they're RNA positive, but let's go publish that and say, oh, there's, there's virus around, right? But the problem is people aren't going the extra distance to say, is a replication competent? and people are using monoclonal antibodies, those didn't work for long COVID. Now they're thinking about the, the Pfizer drug, that's not working for long COVID. You know, the, the fact is uh, a lot of the evidence, at least especially the evidence we have in our hands is, is about viral debris as we discussed months and months and months ago. Um, and that's okay, because that's the same discussion that goes on in Lyme. Excellent, um, Valentina, any? Uh, yes. So in terms of your treatment protocol, did anything change considering your research findings and the uh, categorization of long COVID that mm -hmm. you have discovered? And uh, in case Maraviroc and studying combination doesn't show significant improvement in patients, what are your alternative options? Yeah, uh, I think it's a great question. But what we did in the paper that's now out in print print, which I showed the figures from where we did have response to Maraviroc and statins in five symptom categories, all was very, very statistically significant p-values. Um, that's a prelude to our clinical trial. That's how we're going to design it so that, as I mentioned, we get pure PASC. We don't get PASC plus. PASC plus being EBV, Lyme, CMV, take your pick, right? Um, we are getting a very pure population uh, of PASC. And yes, we use, we use other drugs. We use fluvoxamine. We've used statins, I think, are absolutely key. We use statins in acute COVID. We use statins in, um, in long COVID. And we use statins to protect people if they choose to get the vaccine to prevent any um, vascular insult um, due to the S1 protein. Okay. So, you know, that, that will always be the, one of the foundations of our treatment. Excellent. Okay. Now, wonderful. Now, listen, I think that this is now the part that um, I get to just listen and, and, uh, and listen to all of these concepts. So what I'm going to do is bring everyone in here at the moment. And um, it allows us the opportunity to just have an open discussion. And if you don't mind, I'll, I'll listen very carefully to everyone. And one of the things that I, I want to say is that um, I saw this pattern when I was doing dementia research where you see all these variations you know you have all kinds of dementia and it looks like a whole mush and i'm starting to see a similar issue with regards to long COVID. and my challenge is that i believe that if we don't find the way that every single piece of this connects the neurology, the histamine, the clotting, the cytokines, every piece needs to connect in one complete theory in order for us to really make big progress with regards to COVID-19. Any thoughts from anybody on that challenge that's in front of us? Well, only that it sort of goes into what I said in my spotlight, which is, I mean, we can argue about how many pieces of a jigsaw puzzle we've got in front of us, but I feel like we've got a bit here, a bit there, a bit there, a bit here. And really, it's about how do we fill it all together so we've got a really clear picture of the whole thing. Now, I don't know how many, you know, how many pieces of that jigsaw puzzle some of our speakers think we have, whether it's 50 or 500 out of the thousands. I'd be interested to hear how close some of our speakers think we are to actually filling that whole picture uh, together so that we really do have a sort of a theory of everything for what's going on. Well, Any thoughts from me? Go ahead, Bruce. Yeah, uh, I, I really appreciate those thoughts. I mean, Jez, that really puts it into context. But how many diseases do we have all the jigsaw put together? You know, if you look at any disease, lupus always comes to mind for me. I, you know, when I started out in, in autoimmunity um, before I got into virology and I've never, it's still um, not completely understood. 
And one of the reasons we're pushing proteomics is because everybody's used genetics to look into tissues to see if these autoimmune diseases are due to some, some infection. Are we missing something because we were looking for genes instead of proteins? That's why we're pushing proteomics. But the fact is, back to the diseases, there's still some that have been around forever where I don't think we have every piece of the puzzle. The issue is, can we get to somewhere that, that, that we can make people better? And I think that's what we've been trying to do. And you know what? People are saying, well, you we have 17,000 patients. Why don't you do a, a clinical trial? Well, we are. But we had to be able to say, I know what's pure PASC versus MECFS variant versus fibromyalgia versus post Lyme. Until you can do that, and, and the reason the paper was 20 patients or whatever is because we wanted to test if we used very, very discrete entry criteria and exclusion criteria, um, can we um, get to the point where we can get statistical significance on symptom scores, which is how we're going to be judged by the FDA. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, test run complete. Okay. Now we dig into our database of, of 17, 18,000 now. I, I wanted to bring in Manon here because I think that one of the things that um, you are trying to highlight is that we're going to be facing uh, a tsunami of neurological patterns across the world. Any thoughts as to how, because neurology is already difficult, how in the world are we going to be able to get this to work? See, it comes from the uh, uh, words from the presentation in the previous session. You know, you have to know that which particular biomarker in the CSF or the blood can be a way in which you can see the face of the neurocovid. Now, if uh, some of them have been identified, I mean, like uh, in acute COVID or the long COVID, it's a new disease, you know. So, we uh, need to invest in biomarkers that actually give some clues towards the ongoing injury because you can't uh, uh, like image uh, ongoing injury okay till it produces its effects when the effects are there okay then you see it on an mri or ct scan or pet scan but then before that you have to invest in biomarkers too and when if you all agree okay that 62 okay i was just like 70 70 plus if we even agree that 50 percent of the of the complaints or the symptoms in the syndromic picture of long COVID is due to neurological uh, damage, okay? See, uh, why won't we invest in, and give me a reason why won't we invest in the biomarkers that identify uh, some, some markers in the CSF. To just question, okay, I would like to, if you allow, okay, he said that we have to come to a niche, okay, where, where we can combine all organ diseases in COVID. I guess, okay, answering you, but then actually uh, giving a voice to, to all of the, those who are listening. Uh, this this is so very basic, okay? What does it attack? ACE2, NRP1, Remington. If you know the, the targets, you know, and, and then uh, you, you know that, that the, these are so very vividly expressed, okay, over all the tissues, this disease uh, etiology would remain a multi-organ, multi-system. You have to prioritize which uh, uh, syndromic picture needs immediate attention, be it cardiovascular first, okay, and then neurological. So it would be in future like this. The person comes, symptoms and signs, okay, you group together, see what's actually risking his life, and then you treat it, okay? He is, uh, I, I think, I mean, uh, uh, I disagree with you, that finding a single most common cause, okay, that's causing all the symptoms won't happen in long COVID only because of the reason that the ACE2 receptor and NRP receptor, and uh, if we uh, discover a few more in the future, we have to see that they are expressed and studied over all the organs and the tissues of the body. If that's the case, the disease from day one will remain multi-organ, multi-system, and, and I, I wish that we could find a niche, okay, or, or a single cause where we can nail it down. So, yes. I, I, one of the things I wanted to put to Rezia um, because of her work with the, um, with the clotting and so on. Now, I, for anybody who knows what I'm focused on is I've always said that COVID-19, severe COVID-19, is a viral-mediated autoimmune disease. And so therefore, within that principle, I say that long COVID is a viral-mediated persistent autoimmune response, which would fit 
with what you are seeing with regards to the clotting that is happening. Any any thoughts about that? Yes, definitely, Philip. And and what is so um, important, I think, for me to stress is that every single one of the the talks that uh, was presented here today, um, everything fits in into what we have seen with uh, what Dr. Bates said, what Tina said, um, what Bruce said. Uh, I think the important is that um, the the clot trap all of these these inflammatory molecules, where it, or, where it originates, uh, you know, is debatable. Um, however, I think uh, the, the, the answer would be to find the different molecules trapped in, into, inside the clots, find where they originate from. And um, in, importantly, what, what we have noted, what was quite interesting for us is if some of the patients uh, are on the, the anti-clotting therapies, they suddenly complain um, of uh, when the clots start breaking down, they complain of sudden urticaria, um, you know, driving the, the, the symptoms, symptoms that we have, and then it calms down. So I think the, the important thing for me is that uh, whatever we we target we need to find as bruce and everyone said the what the molecules are number one um and then how to stop them from from uh, from being there and the eating these microclots so i think it would be a good thing to start with breaking down the microclots first of all using it as a diagnostic and see if it is indeed present in, in the various cohorts that bruce also talked about uh, with Lyme disease and, and EBV and all of those, it would be good to start there. Mm -hmm. And so I, I wanted to ask um, uh, Tina a, a concept now. Sorry, I'm, I'm getting to ask my questions now. <laughs> and one of the questions that I wanted to ask you, Tina, is that but the interesting thing for me from a clinical perspective is that when it comes to long COVID, I was seeing these patients for years before COVID came. And there was always a pattern that I found that they had GI associated problems. Mm -hmm. So when long COVID hit, it didn't surprise me that I can essentially predict who is going to get long COVID. Yeah. Any thoughts on that? Well, it, yes, it's a very interesting one. I mean, I would say that 98% of my patients have got a previous history of IBS, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, urticaria, um, dermatographism, uh, food intolerances, chronic headaches, and it, it predates the COVID <laughs> for sure. And it just it's so it's so common that um, it suggests a, a link there. Um, and um, you know, sometimes <clears throat> they consider themselves to be very healthy people, of course, but then when you actually ask the specific questions, they have got a lot of IBS issues with gut issues. And then when we do the analysis, they have a lot of dysbiosis, um, leaky gut syndrome, uh, SIBO, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, it seems like that, and we know more and more about the microbiome, don't we, affecting our, our complete uh, you know, constitution and our um, how well we are. So it's, it's a very, it's a good place to start certainly with these patients. Um, and um, and getting it right has improved their health hugely. I mean, I've had patients who've come with um, both MCAS and long COVID and post-vaccine uh, symptoms who've had diarrhea six to eight times a day um, and been absolutely incapacitated by it. And you give them famotidine, and sometimes that stops within 24 hours, which is, Absolutely. you know, incredibly impressive. Um, I, I would I'd love to know uh, more about Bruce's um, paper and how we can drill down, because I feel like I have been working a little bit in the dark, doing the best I can with what information I've got, which isn't very much. Um, and uh, having some specific tests that we can look at and see the links with the different groups and therefore the right you know, way to treat them is, is fantastic. That would be such a gift for us, yeah. really, absolutely amazing. So when are you going to open in England? <laughs> <laughs> but before, before Bruce answers that, I just wanted to ask a question. We're having a, a problem with um, Joachim um, and his, his network connection. But uh, Joachim, can, can you say something here? Uh, I'm just making sure I can hear you. Can you? Huh? 
I, can you say something, Jorge? Uh, you have to switch off your computer. Oh, right. I'll, I'll pause. I'll bring him back. So you go ahead with that, um, Bruce. You answer that question. Um, when can we get the targeting to be able to um, know specifically what we're dealing with? Mm -hmm. Well, I, it's a great question because um, we, in addition to the preprint of the of, of the treatment paper that's already out for peer review, um, we're sending in tomorrow the paper on the category the the cytokine hub categorization of um, of these four conditions that seemingly overlap in uh, in symptoms, and I think that's going to be critical in terms of um, of treatment and how we're looking at response to treatment. In other words, if you took all four of these categories and you put them into a clinical trial uh, and you didn't know the difference between which one, I guarantee that's a quick way to fail a clinical trial um, or not be able to provide the appropriate placebo group. So, you know, it, it, yeah, people can say, well, it's taken in cell DX and Patterson a long time to get a clinical trial. But that's because we've been trying to work on this so that when we do a clinical trial, we know exactly what the placebo group should be and we're going to know exactly what the uh, entry and exclusion criteria are going to be. Now, we may do four clinical trials. We may do post-Lyme, MECFS, fibromyalgia, and, um, and long COVID. In fact, the Lyme, a lot of the Lyme associations are trying to get us to go Lyme first. I mean, that's how critical um, this is in defining, you know, this vascular inflammation, which I think is common to all of these. And, um, but, the, but the bottom line is we need that, that classification scheme. And you know what, we're trying to expand um, our testing, you know, worldwide as quickly as possible. There's been uh, hiccups, obviously, because we've tried to go too fast and we haven't been organized well enough, but I think we're getting there. Um, we're expanding as quickly as possible, and, um, and it, we'll be able to provide uh, this classification scheme um, for, for everyone uh, who, who sees these patients and the great overlap. You know, I think, you know, the MECFS and the post Lyme people are starting to get recognized because they're saying, hey, I have these symptoms. Do I have long? I, by the way, I also had COVID. Do I have long COVID? And you know, I've been testing negative and the response is no, you never had COVID, but it's your Lyme or your, your, your post-treatment Lyme disease or PTLD. So it is absolutely critical as we go forward before we even embark on expensive clinical trials that we know what we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. um, and I think at the end of that, we'll see success. Can I say something? I think, Bruce, it will be what you're doing will be an absolute gift to uh, validate some of the groups of patients who have had great difficulty in being recognized as absolutely real um, and, um, and being treated as such by the medical profession. And actually, if we've got a whole load of tests that we can show are abnormal, then that completely validates their position. So this is going to be a really important piece of work, really. Absolutely. And can I, can I, I'm going to bring in Jez on this point because I think he brings it across so well, which is the concept of the stigma that's associated with long COVID and the fact that people are afraid to talk about it, which makes it seem as though it's only a small problem when there are millions across the world who are struggling daily with it. How do we change that stigma, Jeff? Uh, very good question. Um, I think there's a number of reasons why people don't want to talk about long COVID. Uh, a large part of it is because they aren't sure about the reactions they're going to get from the people they talk to about it. There's a lot of COVID denial and even more long COVID denial. Um, and if you're worried about getting that kind of reaction, that might be a reason why you don't want to bring it up. You may also not want to have the same conversation you've had a thousand times in the last month where you just have to go through that same thing and you don't have the energy for it. For other people, they may not be able to talk about it because it compromises their position at work, um, you know, because then that's going to be, oh, well, this person's got a problem. Is that going to be an issue in terms of their employment? There's a whole number of reasons why people might not want to talk about it. 
and how do we change it? Um, I think it has to come through good science picked up by good reporting in the media. Um, there isn't really a shortcut to it, I don't think. I mean, maybe some other people can, can chime in here too, but I think it does start with the good science and then it starts with good reporting and good media coverage. And we've not always had good media coverage. There's some fairly sloppy headlines here and there and some fairly sloppy reporting here and there. And it's a bit patchy. I mean, that's that's just the nature of the media, right? <laughs> but I, 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 there isn't there isn't just a quick button that you can press that just goes fix that stigma problem. I don't I don't know how you do it. It's a long process, and I guess we've just got to, like Bruce is saying, do the science and get it right. You know, and that will validate the conditions in a way that means that people have to take notice. And Valentino, from that point as a charity, have you guys struggled to get funding? Well, uh, I would like to yeah. Right. I, I just wanted to add a little bit uh, what Gus mentioned um, as the problem of people are afraid of talking about long COVID. I don't think they are afraid of talking about long COVID. They are more afraid of not being understood by medical practitioners. And uh, what we hear is that due to limited protocols available at the GP level, uh, the long COVID condition is not considered seriously. We know that there is media coverage. Uh, it's, it's improved in some it's a bit two years on, but we didn't improve in terms of medical acceptance of long COVID. And uh, I don't think we still have clear protocols developed among medical community. And uh, we know that people are being psychologized and this is serious. Uh, this is easy to say that people are uh, having got issues and long COVID is all in, in your head okay. and not treat them rather than spend time and self-educate yourself as a real medical practitioners, I believe every medical practitioner should do their own research, invest time into novel techniques, novel solutions, novel methods of diagnosis, and help these people, not basically putting everything on their psychology. I mean, they're not getting treatment. Obviously, people suffering over a year would be anxious, would be unhappy would be in a position that they're being said that you need to take antidepressants rather than proper treatment and diagnostics. And this is what we are seeing. And we had a preprint on the similar subject where we have identified large percentage of people being psychologized. And this is a serious problem. Um, so from my perspective, I mean, as a charity, we want every one of you to collaborate, not being isolated in their own pathways and bring this force together. You have labs, you have um, knowledge in a particular area. And when we talk about long COVID, we talk about it as a web of long COVID. There are multiple path pathways and each of you have your own expertise. And I think the crucial part is here to start collaboration, to start large scale trials, to show that these treatments work and that you have identified solutions. And I'm really happy to say that the decinals is first step into these trials that I think every one of you need to incorporate into their trials, see how people will improve uh, from different perspectives, from neurological perspective, from MCAS and Bruce, from your perspective as well, because it may help with vasculitis, it may help to discover new biomarkers, not just those that you are currently uh, focused on. So from charity's perspective and my own wish, I wish all of you would 
jointly put something together that people would benefit and not just being psychologists. I really feel sorry for every sufferer. Thank you. I, I'm getting a chance. George, you've been having some internet connection problems and, um, and Valentina just mentioned about um, medicinals and the fact that you guys are actually trying to do trials and so on. Uh, how difficult is it to get the support that's required? You're muted at the moment, I think. Yeah, excuse my, excuse my bad internet connections today. It's a network problem. Maybe the Russians, I don't know. So, <laughs> um, but what I want to say, it's not, a, not, not so much a question of difficulties. It is a question of expertise. And it's a question of constantly also at the moment adjusting some of the biomarkers that we also think come into play. There is a huge sum of research and amount of research that we have come up with, uh, even going into other enzymes, going into other clotting factors, looking at red blood, blood cell plasticity, looking at, for example, highly oxygenated blood in the venous regions. That means the blood cannot, uh, the oxygen cannot be delivered. There must be other problems. So the amount of open questions and research um, initiatives we need and coordination is still mind-boggling. I think that uh, especially what uh, Dr. Bruce Patterson has done is amazing, really good work to classify and to really bring this now to a, a precision kind of analytic and diagnostic approach. But I think that we are still struggling to find the main balance in the whole system. And, uh, and it's probably not going to be one or two, it's going to be several. And another remark from my side was, of course, also that um, if you look at pure PASC and you exclude Lyme, EVB, other reactivations and comorbidities and so on, uh, that is, of course, good from the scientific point of view to see what is really playing into past. Oh, the lost, lost Joshim again. He'll probably come back. But we're going to formally close in five minutes, but we'll continue to talk afterwards if people are interested, because there's so many points that can come out if anybody can stay. But Shankara specifically, um, what I wanted to, to ask you is that from the perspective of lower income countries who may not have access to quite a lot of these things, what is your perspective in terms of what can be done? Because, you know, a lot of these blood tests are expensive. You know, uh, we know what it's like in, in, the, in the third world. We can't afford to be left behind in that sense. Any thoughts? Yeah, I think, uh, Philip, uh, there is hope. Uh, when we look at the diversity of what we see, we know basically the systems that are influenced during the acute phase of COVID respiratory, gastrointestinal, and neurological, the circulatory system. And we, we have a reasonable understanding of how these are afflicted. And the, what, what we see is that uh, the lack of early treatment is what allows these to spiral out of control in different directions. And the longer you leave it, the diversity of symptoms presenting with long COVID becomes more vast and more difficult to actually predict and bring back to the root of the problem. So I think two things need to get done. We need to be able, through Bruce's work, to actually uh, differentiate the different types of long COVID so we know what we're treating. But I think secondly, we need to accept that this syndrome does exist so that as uh, medical practitioners, we can diagnose it a lot earlier and treat it a lot earlier, which will make treatment a lot more successful. So the ostracization of patients, uh, people being uh, thought of as being psychotic because of long COVID is, a no, is an absolutely no go. I think 15% of patients with a medical condition actually present to the doctor. The other 85% spontaneously heal or try other things. So when a patient comes to a doctor and says something's wrong, they're one of that 15% and something is definitely wrong. So if we can't diagnose it, we need to admit that we don't know, rather than say nothing's wrong. And so we need to accept long COVID as a condition, start to classify it, uh, clarify it, and then we'll be on our way to treating it, because this is going to rear its head again in vaccine side effects with patients exposed to the same spike mm -hmm. protein. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I think that what we'll do now um, is that I'm going to 
formally close and just for people who are listening this is so this is such a, a rare opportunity to get all these experts together to bounce ideas around that um we'll continue talking for as long as they can handle it and whoever has to jump off can jump off um at any point um so uh, just to say we're going to formally play that outro um but you guys just stay on the line and uh we're going to to keep on going um, with that. So thank you to everyone who have been with us so far. Please continue to stay with us if you would like to hear more discussions. And um, we'll certainly be continuing this discussion um, for the next few minutes, hopefully, as long as people can tolerate it. So thank you again and look out for some other interesting presentations, conferences and interviews. Have a great evening. That was enough there. So thank you very much. OK, guys. Now. This is this is some um, heavyweight stuff in a sense that um, we 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 have to to chat about. And George, your yeah, I hope your your internet connection can survive. Now, one of the things that um, I am I'm focused on, as I said before, is that I think that it's absolutely critical that we have a unifying theory that is able to tie all these pieces together. And without that, I think that we will find that long COVID will become chronic fatigue syndrome. And I think that chronic fatigue syndrome is a failure of medicine to find solutions. It's not that this is what it is, is that we have not looked hard enough and we have not been able to um, get all the right things in place. So we can't afford to do that with regards to long COVID. How can that be, how can that be changed? Well, I think chronic fatigue is a good example. I mean, when I was at Stanford, it was all about CMV and, um, you know, treating CM, chronic fatigue, I mean, cytomegalovirus, before that was EBV. Um, and the fact is, you know, no one's really looked, um, you know, at the proteome in chronic fatigue, and there may even be subpopulations of subpopulations within chronic fatigue. And, um, and, and again, I think it all goes back to um, physicians focusing too much on symptoms and treating symptoms and not treating causes. And I think that's, we started um, in terms of treating causes and looking for the causes um and i think that's absolutely critical because um we're just chasing our tail if we're going to treat uh you know symptoms or you know for a lot of the autoimmune diseases, just put on in immunosuppressives instead of maybe immune modulators i mean I, I i you know kind of back to jez's comment about puzzle pieces i don't think we have a lot of puzzle pieces a lot of this stuff and I think we have to look in different ways because certainly the genome, solely looking at things genomically um, and not from other perspectives, um, biochemistry, nutrition, uh, proteome, I mean, uh, microbiome. I mean, I, 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 you know, I think we're, we're, we're back to the starting line with a lot of this, but I think it's because we, we've gained this perspective in long COVID um, that this is really, really complicated. In 30 years of pathology, COVID is one of the most complicated things I've ever seen. I mean, HIV is starting to look simple after spending 20 years in that and, and looking at COVID now. Um, may I make a comment on that? Because I'm not in your industry and I'm kind of like a ricochet rogue entry into this whole uh, field. And um, so, you're talking in symptoms many other doctors talk symptoms then you have the uh, in between like more description of the condition with the underlying markers that you can find and then from there off from there on we will kind of um have to look into the more nitty-gritty details like dr mana is showing and professor pretorius which are then more the real nitty-gritty molecular um, uh, biological uh, biological pathways so and if I can offer that, we have gone through 24-7 extensive research into all these nitty-gritty little details, looking at all the co-infections, looking at 
uh, the biome, looking at where the gut brain access, looking at all kinds of um, pretty low reported even things, and we included them in the research. So um, I, uh, I can share my, my um, presentation with all of you and have a look at it. And maybe it is helpful for you just, just looking at all the biomarkers and all the different descriptions of pathways that can come into play to one more time reevaluate, because um, we have another problem that will be also an ongoing mid to long term damage that is also occurring. Now we see that amyloid uh, plaque deposition aggregation, we see a lot of prime like uh, um, uh, domains on the spike protein, um, we see a lot of all the autoimmune damages happening, uh, metabolic uh, disorders, and uh, not even to talk about the immune deficiency that uh, what you were rightfully describing. So, to prevent, and you have then the epigenetic settings, uh, that means the, the, C, the BRCA1, P53 being methylated, and all of these things will play out in the long term uh, to play into uh, probably also cancer, same as it has with EVB. So, um, our idea is to provide um, everybody with a with a, say a baseline nutraceutical intervention that is possible that can help in all these factors where it's dysregulated or needs correction to do something useful. And then on top of that, I'm working now on the CIRC1 pathways, like we learned a lot from the anti-aging kind of longevity research from uh, Dr. Sinclair from Harvard. And so we are looking at identifying more and more molecules that can be given in combination to help bring that already in the right direction as a help to you guys, to all the medics and doctors and to all the uh, scientists that go in, um, in, in, the, in, the, say, in the more conventional way of treating. We are not treating, we are helping the body to rebalance. So if you're interested, we can uh, I can share my slides with you, have a look at it, and maybe you find some pathways where you say, oh, that's interesting. Um, I don't know if... Uh, if you ever heard of the snake venom, venom enzyme yeah, that is upregulated in, in COVID very high. SPLA2, and Professor Peratorius might know that, and that can also lead to a lot of clotting, and if that is around, it needs to be addressed. So the list of things that we don't know yet, and that might play a role, is much, much larger than the list what we need. And my plea to all of you would be, can we get some doctors that can look at patients with or without our nutraceutical intervention, it doesn't matter, but to look at, again, one more time, throw out the net a little bit further and see if we catch some more, um, let's say, really represented uh, biomarkers, blood serum markers that can help us to understand this disease better. I think you, your panel is fine. I ran all our molecules against your panel to see if they can help, and now we want to see in real time how that goes. So, for example, if I would say we have 20, 30 patients in the US, can we collaborate and look at them with your panel, at least at what we can find there? And maybe can we add some other markers that also Dr. Shankara, uh, uh, Shankara uh, has been discussing with me and also the group around Valentina, that we add some more markers that we deem interesting? Would that be a suggestion so that we all start collaborating closer? That's very appreciated. I mean, like, I mean, that, from our no, sorry, Doctor Bruce, please go. Help, help yeah. um, we have a thousand new uh, patients register every two weeks, so our access to patients is uh, enormous, and um, would love to, um, you know, implement meant some uh, modalities that um, are complementary and uh, maybe address um, some of the things that uh, that we haven't been looking for. So, yeah, we're, um, uh, I would be very excited to do that. So um, I think once I am able to step back and look at, uh, have we shared all the presentations from today? Um, is there a way to share all those amongst ourselves? Um, I personally haven't put anything that I haven't published, so uh, I'm willing to share mine. Yeah, I was saying that I, I've, I've got everything on email, and so I can share that out to everybody, assuming everybody is happy for me to share it with everybody, with, with all the speakers. I think that would be very, very valuable for people to look at the different approaches and the different thinking mm -hmm. that um, that we've got in terms of COVID-19, in, in terms of managing it. I'll I, I tell you one of the things that bothers me, and I say this 
all the time. And I think that it is, I think that COVID-19 has caught out the medical and scientific fraternity. I think we've become lazy in our approach to disease. I think that if we didn't understand type one diabetes before, I think that if type one diabetes appeared now, we would not figure it out. I think it's because of our approach to medicine that is driving this kind of problem. To, to give an example, I usually say, we still don't know hypertension. We cannot still explain. We have a hundred drugs to treat it and we don't know why certain people have hypertension. It's not acceptable. And this is what is, is, is probably the thing that I can feel most strongly out of COVID-19. We've been caught out by this and we have to, as scientists and clinicians, find answers. I think the patients demand it of us. It's true. Yeah, it's true. Mm. And, then, and then the other thing um, that we're battling with now is, um, like I said in the intro, um, you know, social media um, pitting all of us against one another and saying, oh, they're not, you know, there's no collaboration or, you know, this stuff doesn't work, that stuff doesn't work. You know what? Yeah, we have a 85% success rate out of 18,000. That's 1,500 patients that for one reason or another, maybe it was early before we had the new classification, didn't respond, you know, and every single one of them is on Twitter saying it didn't work. And, you know, at the end of the day, um, we should all be pulling in the same direction. And it's, you know, I was never faced with this in HIV where we had to deal with, uh, with the social media um, blowback. And, um, you know, it's, I'll, I'll tell you, I wish Jez was on here. Um, it's not helping. It's not helping COVID. It's not helping long COVID. Um, and, um, and I think it's, I, when I became a physician, I never thought I would have to deal with um, media, especially social media, like, like it's been. It's been absolutely bonkers. <laughs> it, it's, it's something to get used to. You're absolutely right. It is, it is certainly, certainly challenging that, uh, and I don't expect it to get any better, no. um, to be, to be honest with you. No. Um, and so, yeah, so it's, 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 it's a, it's a big issue. This is why I'm saying is that, um, I think it's because there isn't the connection between all these different pieces. Yeah. This is what patients are feeling. I, I guess a good person to ask on this is Valentina. Sorry to put you on the spot, Valentina, but you know exactly what we're talking about. Well, <laughs> I can tell that media works in both directions. In our case, we, we got uh, to know thousands of people through media channels, and we know that they suffer. Without media channels, we wouldn't know them because clinics wouldn't accept them. And, uh, you know, there was no place for them to, to get involved and find people alike and share their experiences. So with this regard, I think media works really well in supporting people and uh, connecting them to the right channels and getting to read more because uh, as patients, for example, I don't think five years ago uh, people read so many research papers. Now with this condition, I think people become smarter. They're uh, able to self-educate. They are able to identify some critical issues in research and bring these challenges on, on the table and discuss it, which is great, I think, because they are no longer isolated and focused on what doctors said. And we know that not all doctors are quite well educated in one or another condition. So this is why I said all doctors need to be in hand with the research findings, with up to, be up to date with research, and uh, get to know the disease quickly, not from social media, but they must follow research and do research. Otherwise, 
people will be educating doctors. So that's where we are heading, actually. That's the problem. For uh, From doctor's perspective, I don't know, I can't make comments uh, how social media works, but as a charity, I can clearly say that we are able to drive research faster using social media and social sciences. Uh, and I think this works well for us. And I'm happy that I managed to connect to all of you through social media. And I managed to connect uh, with people who suffer and help them answer questions that are relevant to their symptoms, as I say, because not all doctors are able to answer these questions and you know find the pieces of this puzzle and help them so media works for us uh and as i said i can't comment from doctor's perspective and personally from what you do and what issues are raised against <laughs> uh, but we need to support these people on media because this is the only place where they find support and Manan, in terms of Pakistan, how how bad is the problem? Because Pakistan didn't actually suffer too badly with COVID. Is the long COVID not so much an issue? Oh, you're muted at the moment, Manan. Okay. So that's uh, correct. I mean, like, since we did have a lot of uh, COVID patients, so the fraction that drive from them, okay, belonging to the subcategory of long COVID are not much. And then uh, uh, I wish help to everybody, but then that actually hampers your attempts to go for trials and patients, you know, which I'm not doing with my international collaborators, or I would like to love to do it with, with uh, uh, any one of you or all of you here. But then uh, basic sciences research is what uh, I was focused on and my peers were. So we are thinking of making a group. Now we have got 16 patients, you know, but then uh, the wave is too slow and it's good okay i mean like i always think on the side of the patients that that if not much are affected okay that's a blessing in itself but having said that uh, the thing is there is a piece of uh, confusion like everywhere else you know in a home okay if a person after three weeks or in three months keeps on complaining they actually uh, uh, not only the social media not only uh, uh, other places in the media in the home, okay, I see guys have told me that that my parents, okay, sometimes relatives start saying, what's this? Okay, I'm coming out of it. Okay, you come out of it. I mean, give me a break here. If he or she could have come out of it, okay, why he or she would be complaining in the first place? That's happening in many places, okay, in many homes and many, uh, I mean, uh, groups. So they are they are worried. I mean, they, they just text me through and, and Valentina was so right, okay, if we didn't have Twitter or Facebook. Uh, I, I wouldn't have heard them because they are very sometimes reluctant to discuss when they see that okay somebody cares okay and he's actually for or she's actually for there for them to listen at least okay they would share I've got now 16 patients I mean like those 16 are saying we know three more you know so yeah the wave is less and uh, that uh, that uh, that's uh, good news okay from the point of view that yeah much patients are not affected but uh, on long COVID uh, trials of drugs and discovery. We uh, are open to collaborate with with all of you guys, okay, Bruce, and 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 uh, Joachim, you know, and Valentina already has me on the board. So just like feel free. I mean, like on on any aspect of bioinformatics, Doctor uh, 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 Shankara, you feel uh, my inputs would be important. Let's shake hands. Like Joachim was saying, you know, that that's a very much needed thing. This though this is a talk, okay, public talk. We came here. But it also provides us an opportunity to, to keep on uh, uh, collaborating with uh, each other okay, in the future. Yes, yes, yes. I think um, it's probably about time for us to wrap up. This has been a tremendous discussion and um, one that I think has opened eyes. Um, we've still had the pleasure. I think 140 people are still sitting with us <laughs> and watching this. But I think it, it's probably time for us to, to wrap up at the moment. So. Thank you all very much for being part of this um, this Congress. And um, I hope that uh, as we make progress, we can all get together again and hopefully be giving much clearer answers, uh, clearer answers to 
everyone. Uh, Bruce, you're a critical piece of that puzzle. Um, George M., uh, we, we hope you continue to develop those treatments that will help and support everyone. And um, we all look forward to work in the future. So thank you all and have thank a great you. evening. Thank you. Nice thank you. Thanks, guys. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye.